Thank you, everyone, for having me. Um, I'm going to do a quick uh, bit about my background. Uh, some of you might already know me. Those that don't know me, I've been around for a while in a few different formats uh, throughout crypto. I've been an entrepreneur. I've been a full-time research analyst. I've invested in about 100 projects at this point. And um, my company, Masari, is a data and research company that's been active for about six years really working on uh, two concurrent problems within the industry. How do you actually standardize information uh, from emerging communities in a structured way that traditional finance or, or more professional firms um, might be used to in the form of quarterly reporting? We actually work with SUI um, and, uh, and about 80 other projects. And then on the other hand, we actually slice and dice all that information and make it accessible to individual professionals, whether they're in strategy, compliance, uh, investing, et cetera. So uh, I, I think mostly just from having a smarter team and having been around for a long time, have, have a unique set of insights. It ultimately leads to an annual report that um, has become uh, pretty popular over the years, the, uh, the annual thesis. So when I was first approached by the organizers, they said, hey, crypto moves fast. You wrote that report four months ago and I'm, not going to write 200-page reports more than once a year, uh, because otherwise I probably would not have my family. Um, and as a, as a bonus here, uh, speaking of my family, I am going to do this presentation uh, in the same format that I did it a couple of weeks ago after I had had a couple of uh, beers at the pubs in London around Digital Asset Summit, and I presented the same thing to a Fortune 100 CEO late at night, and they loved it. So, uh, or at least they told me they did, and they followed up with us. So uh, you're going to get the good stuff today. I would say these are the top 10 uh, themes for the remainder of the year. So what do I think is, is still most pressing uh, and, and obvious and interesting uh, when we're looking forward and, and how have some of these prognostications aged over the last four months from the annual report that I'd written? Okay, top 10 themes. I'm a simple guy. If you take two or three themes out of this, out of 10, you at least know when this presentation is going to be over, worst case. Uh, and best case is you take two or three of these and you come away with something interesting. So I like to keep it super simple from 30,000 feet. Um, and this is, I think, a benefit of experience being in crypto for as long as I have. This is actually the third full cycle that I've, I've actually experienced and lived through. And you can look at numbers on a chart, but when you've actually lived through these 85% drawdowns, the face ripping rallies, the FOMO in both directions, the people that have gone on under the, the main characters that have churned. I do think that some of these uh, metrics matter that I'm going to show you. And the, um, the, the first theme, I think it always ties back to Bitcoin. I know we're, we're obviously at a, a really exciting event for SUI here, uh, one of the most promising uh, emerging networks and, and ecosystems in crypto. But the health of the ecosystem, I would argue, continues to tie back to Bitcoin, first and foremost. And as Bitcoin goes, so goes the rest of the market. There's two things that I tend to look for as to whether the market is getting overheated or whether we feel like it's at a sustainable pace. The first one is the MVRV Z-score. Basically, it's a way to flatten out one of my favorite metrics in crypto, which is actually the second of these two graphics that looks at the market capitalization versus the realized market capitalization, so in other words, the integral of all of the historical Bitcoin and when it last moved and the price that it last moved at. So if you have 2013 Bitcoin and you had 100 Bitcoin in 2013, the realized market cap of those 100 Bitcoin would be something like $10,000 versus if you had 0.15 Bitcoin today, that realized market cap would also be about $10,000. So it's a way to kind of smooth out the holders over time. And what you see in the second chart is when things get really, really hot, that MVRV score gets out of control. So you can see the, the local tops in 2013, in 2018, in 2021, they all hit this threshold of about seven at the absolute top in those market cycles. So first thing I'd, I remind everybody of is the market might feel like it's been ripping. We've certainly, you know, we're up about four times from the bottom. Some of the meme coins are exploding. We'll get to those later. Um, and, uh, and, and it seems like everything is going up and to the right. So the first question is, is this another bubble? And I would argue that based on uh, this pretty reliable predictor of market momentum and, and whether something is overheated, I'd say that we're somewhere in the fair value to the upslope uh, of this current trend, especially given some of the tailwinds that we have on the, on the institutional side. 
The second thing that I like to remind people of is, as much as you're excited about SUI, maybe, or some of the other emerging assets, emerging networks, you might think that they have more potential, more applications, more utility. If Bitcoin dominance falls below 40%, get the hell out of the market. Um, that has been the, an even better predictor of when things are wildly overheated. And if you had just followed these two metrics, you would have outperformed, I think, 90% of investors if you're trying to actually think about when to average in or average out of positions. The reverse is also true, by the way. And I'd given this presentation with the same uh, first slide in August 2022, and I said the bottom's in. Now, I was off by a few months. I didn't know that Sam had defrauded everybody and was using QuickBooks on his back end, but I was pretty close because a few months later, that was the bottom, and then we've got to obviously come off of that. Uh, the second one is, uh, I think, a subject that everybody's intimately familiar with, with the just wall of money that's been coming in following the approval of the Bitcoin ETFs earlier this year. And I think uh, at the time that we wrote the annual report, we basically said that this was going to be simultaneously the most overhyped and underappreciated uh, change, structural change in the crypto markets, because this is really the first nibble that traditional finance firms and large institutions have at entering the crypto space reliably. The second one, I'd argue, is actually going to be stable coins. The third will be assets like Ethereum and many of the other emerging networks. But this has just been a relentless up and to the right inflow that continues to accelerate. Um, and I think we haven't even really started to see traditional uh, investors that are, are focused on momentum trading yet. So uh, much like I said on the previous slide, I think Bitcoin adoption leads to this, uh, not just uh, institutional adoption and, and that being the first nibble, but more, maybe more importantly, it leads to crypto infrastructure installation. Uh, in the first couple of cycles, we used to joke about the institutions are coming or the institutions are here. And then there would always be some buzzword as soon as the market corrected 20% for like, well, I really like blockchain, not Bitcoin, or, you know, the underlying ledgers are interesting, but uh, I don't really know about these crypto assets. Like maybe if, if only the adults in the room could get together at JP Morgan and Goldman Sachs, then they'd be able to actually solve this. And, um, and I think from an infrastructure standpoint, the previous two cycles, it was definitely premature to bet that we were going to have staying power as an industry versus where I think we are today, where all of the major institutions, and this is not necessarily a good thing, but basically all the major institutions and the asset managers that have started ETFs are using Coinbase. Other institutional money managers, they're using anchors. They're using the crypto native technology, the crypto native infrastructure companies, and I think that chasm is getting crossed. Um, and the volatility in the end market, I would say, is actually our best friend because it allows the incumbents to build, the specialists to build, and we're not subject to the same whims of a Fortune 500 uh, financial firm's uh, board of directors where as soon as the going gets tough, they cut crypto activity thanks to quarterly earnings pressure versus um, what, what the, the true missionaries in the industry have been able to do the last few cycles. Uh, theme number three should be popular in here. Uh, I have been uh, extremely bearish on Ethereum, the asset, on a relative basis. So I don't mean this as a knock, but it is very difficult to retain 70% market share in any industry when there's as many competitive uh, threats and, and there's much potential economic value on the line as there is within crypto. So when you think about Ethereum, for a while, there was this meme about triple threat, what was it called? Triple threat asset or something like that, right? Where it's, it's a commodity, it's a network, it's, a, you know, it's, it's basically everything to everybody. And um, what I had argued for a while, and I think what our team had argued for a while is, well, Bitcoin is better being Bitcoin in a store of value than Ethereum is. And some of these other emerging alternative, you know, integrated L1s like Solana and now Sui and, and others, um, they're going to be much faster and cheaper. And there's also much less complexity when you talk about, you know, Ethereum's roadmap. You're not bridging between uh, different roll-up chains. You don't have the same problems as, as you're thinking about um, just actually conducting transactions through a wallet. So um, that 70% was very difficult to defend from the confluence of factors of just how many technical challenges and user challenges Ethereum was going to have to confront as it continued to scale. And we've seen that play out so far this year. I think this remains true. Um, Denkun, obviously a killer upgrade uh, that I think is, is, has brought more scalability, lower fees to the, the broader Ethereum ecosystem, but I don't think it's enough. 
um, to actually maintain that level of market cap dominance. So what you really look for is communities like this that are ultimately decentralizing the L1 ecosystem. Um, one of my conviction bets is that decentralization at a specific network level does not actually matter that much, and we've actually seen this play out. Yes, it's important as you continue to scale, but in the early stages, I would actually say it's not that important. If the tech is strong and it's on a solid foundation, not a house of cards, it's not that important that things are decentralized from day one, simply because you already have so many different layer one options or layer two options to actually execute on-chain transactions. Um, and then finally, I'm, a, I'm definitely, I'd say, an Ethereum ETF skeptic, uh, mostly, not, not because it shouldn't be approved, but mostly because I think that the politization, politicization of crypto in the U.S. in particular um, is, a, is a national embarrassment, which will be no surprise for anyone that's followed me on Twitter and knows how I really feel about the U.S. government right now. Um, we're going to get to that in, in the next slide because that's going to be an important theme for the rest of the year. And we're going to talk about the U.S. election, which I do think is, is uh, the most important for this industry. Right? We'll, we'll leave aside the, the broader um, consequences and, and, and some of the loaded issues that I think are, are um, leading into this election. But for crypto in particular, it's going to be a very consequential one. Um, in the meantime, theme four, a two-horse race. Um, is this basically Solana versus ETH or is this... ETH versus the world, and are you going to see other integrated layer ones kind of creeping up the leaderboards like Solana did um, over the course of 2023? I actually think that Solana proves that the integrated L1 model is sustainable, and you're going to see more specialized uh, layer one networks. You're going to see more ecosystems evolve, um, like SUI, like Aptos, like Say, and, um, and I would expect this to actually we don't like to say it, but this is actually going to look like the banking system uh, in terms of fragmentation and market share. I think the dominant players will have maybe 5%, 10% market uh, share, maybe a little bit more because tech is more scalable. But let's call it um, you know, 20 30% tops. That's going to leave a lot of potential growth for some of the other alternative uh, assets. Um, and Solana is really just, I think, the first and, um, and first out of the gate. It also benefits from having lived through its we thought Solana should have died already, um, crisis post FTX. And that's not nothing. I think that's when you really actually see whether capital is fleeting within your ecosystem, whether you think developers and, and the foundation that they're building on is fleeting or token juiced and incentivized. And, um, and so I think one of the key things that other emerging ecosystems are gonna have to try to replicate is, is how do you actually differentiate and how do you actually steal uh, some market share without just pumping uh, the, the gasoline in the tank using token incentives to encourage people to come over to your, uh, to, to your particular chain. Um, but I do think that the current uh, user experience that I'm maybe paying most attention to the rest of the year is what happens with Phantom, Jupiter, Solana versus Coinbase, Uniswap, Base. And then if there are any dark horses that enter the race and uh, actually start to play a meaningful role in this market share comparison. You notice I, I actually took them out. This is a good chart from Artemis. Um, these two charts, they actually have a few other L1s. Uh, they didn't really register, honestly, uh, in terms of magnitude. So I excluded them. You can, uh, you can check this out on your own time, though, if you want to see the actual uh, raw numbers. All right, theme number five. Um, does anyone else know that this past week was a record week for actually banked stablecoins in terms of market capitalization? Raise your hand if you knew that. Okay, so like seven people that are paying attention. You just learned that. You're lying. You literally just saw this. Yeah. Um, so yeah, a record. I mean, if you, can, if you take out Luna from the equation, which was not truly a banked stablecoin, right? It was an algorithmic stablecoin that had its peak and you know, boom and bust. Um, but this is the healthiest the digital dollar industry, if you will, has ever been, or the crypto dollar industry has ever been. We just saw a new uh, all-time high between USDC and uh, USDT uh, this week, and it continues to accelerate, as you can see from the tail end of that chart right there. And I mentioned before, I think this is important because um, Bitcoin is probably going to be the asset that is most important from a store of value and narrative standpoint, getting institutions interested. Because, you know, an institution like JP Morgan or Morgan Stanley or, or a, a, a payment, you know, a focused bank like, um, like Citi, they're not necessarily going to get too 
jazzed about the rest of the crypto industry. Um, and they might not even necessarily be that excited uh, about crypto dollars per se, because they already have all these deposits. But when you start to see momentum like this and you start to see the potential differentiation um, that you can carve out for yourselves as a regula regulated financial institution, this is going to be really important. This is one of the primary areas of potential growth within the US if we can get um, positive legislation passed regarding dollar-denominated stablecoins and bank stablecoins uh, either this year or early next year in a new administration. And importantly, there's no two paths into crypto with higher interest rates. Interest rates goes down. This chart, essentially, interest rates is zero. Bitcoin booms. Interest rates start climbing up. Bitcoin falls. This is the first time we've actually seen this, though, this intersection where if interest rates come down from 5%, that's only going to put more fuel into the tank for assets like Bitcoin and other emerging assets and higher beta plays. But if they stay where they are, there's actually real economic reasons for people to adopt crypto dollars and actually benefit from taking a, a, a VIG on that 5% that is currently uh, available just by buying uh, the, the, the reserve asset or the, or the treasury assets right now. Um, all right, so uh, I know we're in Europe, but this is important. Uh, Mika is essentially on autopilot. I think it is an important development uh, in that something got done in Europe, and there is some regulatory clarity. Um, and uh, if you're a regulator in, in the EU, if you could just hold your hands over your ears for just one second. Um, I, I think it's, it's terrible. Uh, it's a terrible regulatory uh, position to actually build a foundation from. And, and I actually think it's going to hold back Europe quite a bit as it's getting implemented. It, it, it looks like there are some pretty glaring problems that need to be fixed. Um, and it's tempting to look at the EU and say, like, well, we have Mika, we have Mika 2, we have all this forward progress. And look at the Americans. They can't do anything. They're firing their speaker every few months. Uh, the government is in chaos. It's going to be Trump and Biden again, and they're old. All those things are true. But sometimes gridlock is better than action. And I would actually argue that that's the case in the US right now, where this coming election is going to be critically important uh, in terms of whether it's uh, Republican or you know, uh, Democrat presidency. It always is important. Uh, however, the biggest thing that I think we're going to be keeping a close eye on is what happens in the Congress. So there's two chambers of Congress in the US. Um, the House of Representatives, which is quite friendly and, and I think proactive on a bipartisan um, uh, basis in the U.S. And then you've got the Senate, which is the most hostile body, I'd say, maybe you know, anywhere on earth uh, that, um, that is currently blocking essentially all forward progress within the crypto industry. And it really comes down to one senator, uh, this uh, senator in Massachusetts, Elizabeth Warren, that some of you may have heard about. So um, we've actually spent a lot of time as an industry actually not just educating policymakers, but for the first time this cycle, actually uh, participating with real capital to swing elections. And uh, a couple of the uh, so-called political action committees have already been making some, some major headway. The public is noticing, the media is noticing, and Congress is certainly noticing as well. So there is a, there is a uh, pretty good chance that you have a Goldilocks scenario uh, that I would argue in the US for crypto where everything flips. Um, so the presidency flips to the Republicans versus the, de the Democrats. The House actually flips from the Republicans to the Democrats. And then you have um, the Senate, which would flip the other direction. So you still have divided government somewhat, but it's essentially the two chambers flip and the presidency flips. That would actually give us, I think, the most clarity and, um, and potentially the most um, collaborative legislation that we could imagine both for stable coins, um, for infrastructure uh, regulation and, and, and crypto exchange level regulation and protect DeFi and privacy and some of the things that we, we have all been fighting for and believe are super important uh, to make sure that we preserve. Um, and then there's you know, what actually happens in January of next year. And this is actually where I think um, Mika has done a very good job. And uh, in Dubai and, and UAE, VARA uh, has, been, has been very effective. Uh, MAS in Singapore has been, has been very effective. And just using a common sense approach for, okay, what should network level disclosures or their equivalent look like so that we're leveling the playing field for all market participants? 
And if you go back to that first slide that I showed about Masari, this is actually what we've spent the last six years doing, is essentially building a bottoms up uh, crypto asset reporting system where we actually act on behalf of projects to read directly from the blockchain, to look directly at the GitHub repos, to look directly at the governance DAOs or you know, whichever you know, important governance bodies are involved. And then we actually do the work to uh, automate and then add market commentary and color commentary to what has actually been happening in these ecosystems on a day-to-day -day and then on a quarterly basis. Um, so this is going to be a big area of focus for us. It has been since day one, but we're really uh, throwing everything that we have at this problem because with a new administration with a new Congress, regardless of which way the election goes in the US, there is a chance to actually come with a gift wrap market solution that's going to work not only in the US, but it's going to work in Europe under Mika, it is going to work in um, the UAE and, uh, and, and, and throughout Asia, et cetera. So um, we are in an all out sprint, not just us, but anyone else that's kind of in this uh, realm, whether you're talking about Dune Analytics on the one hand or some of the governance uh, analytics companies on the other. I may be most excited about this because. If you just take a step back and you look at first principles, what are they asking for? Well, the SEC is arguing that these assets need to be regulated and they need to go through a registration process and they need to do these quarterly filings. Well, we, this is a solved problem, right? So if you think about the spirit of existing consumer protections laws and investor, uh, investor protection laws, uh, this is largely a solved problem based on the default transparency that the crypto ecosystem has. So keep a close eye on this, particularly with, uh, with us and, and some of the other information companies. And I won't spend too much time on this because I think that this is very uh, much a, a U.S. Well, maybe not. I'm actually not as familiar. But, the, um, but I think this is largely a, a U.S.-based uh, innovation right now. It, um, and I'm not actually quite sure about where some of the liability ends with DAOs in, in Europe. But uh, in the U.S., not having clear uh, regulation around DAOs. And, um, and some incorporation mechanism has basically made it impossible to handle taxes, to limit liability, to um, actually create any type of you know, kind of fee generating mechanisms to contract. So um, this new uh, legal wrapper that was just introduced in one single state in the US is, is probably one of the things that I'm keeping a close eye on, as well as uh, any emerging legal constructs internationally that could wrap around some of these decentralized communities so that they can interface a little bit more easily with the real world. And then um, second to last, we're almost there. I know this is a long, long monologue. Um, so uh, bear with me for, for two more minutes here, one minute and 40 seconds, and we'll end with a fun one. Um, I think this is maybe the first cycle that I've actually been really excited about DeFi, DPIN, and decentralized social on a fundamentals basis. You know, fundamentals is almost uh, a four-letter word, or you know, it's, it's, it's almost you know, mocked at this point if you're actually looking at the crypto assets based on fundamentals versus narratives. Part of that because of the market that we're in and, and the way that hype cycles work, but I think part of that has um, historically been uh, proven to be a fairly reasonable uh, assumption because these, at, these emerging ecosystems are so early so you're really looking at uh, technical communities. It could go from zero to 100 or zero to 500 in the course of months uh, with the right set of tailwinds. Um, but even if you kind of net out the volatility of the market cycles, we've just seen uh, tremendous growth in DeFi. You look at something like um, the, uh, the monthly uh, decentralized exchange fees closing in on 300 million uh, per month across some of the largest uh, DEXs. Um, if you look at the competitiveness of decentralized uh, hardware solutions for things like you know GPU sharing and, and AI. There's a lot of uh, skeuomorphic use cases that have actual real value accrual mechanisms that um, could be competitive with their centralized counterparts. And then last but not least, we've got meme coins. So I want everybody to remember, buy Bowdoin, don't vote for Bowdoin um, if, uh, if you want things to go well in the US. But, um, this uh, is maybe the most controversial kind of subject of, uh, of, of current discussion. And I actually think that meme coins are the toy that proves the scale of the industry cycle over cycle and where we are now. You're looking at assets that can be spun up in a matter of minutes that can actually form early emerging markets and, and have a, a capital formation you know, kind of uh, birth in a matter of hours and ultimately rise to tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars of, of, of market gap and economic activity um, basically overnight. So you look at that and you look at some of these silly things and you're like, okay, this is, uh, 
this is clearly ridiculous and sign of a bubble, but um, I think it's fitting that I'm giving this presentation in, uh, in Europe because uh, LVMH and uh, Arnott uh, just became the wealthiest person in the entire world by selling worthless, valueless meme coin bags and uh, other fragrances. So clearly there's a market for it. I think there's going to be a digital market for it. These meme coins um, are actually three times the size of the NFT market and, and nearly as large as DeFi. And um, I think that there's no reason to be bearish on the next Arnott's being a Bowdoin whale or a Whiff whale or a Dogecoin whale or someone in the middle. So that might be controversial. Uh, it might create some political liabilities and narrative liabilities for us at some point. But for right now, it's the toy that proves the scale of the industry and where we are cycle over cycle. So I hope that's helpful. And um, if, uh, if any of you are in New York this fall, we'll do a very similar conference to this, uh, this fall, Mainnet in, uh, in New York at the end of September. So it's a beautiful time to come. Hopefully, we'll have as good a weather as we had uh, this week uh, for our visit in Paris. So thank you, everyone.